This video looks at well-posed predictive control and focuses on what happens when you use a short output horizon. We're looking then at changing the output horizon within MPC or in particular we're going to use a GPC algorithm and we're going to start by considering the optimization from a conceptual point of view rather than just jumping straight in to some simulation examples which we'll do afterwards. You remember from the previous video in this chapter that the word well posed is used to indicate that the optimization makes good sense. So in other words, the optimization gives a result that you can have confidence in. A reminder here that we're assuming that there's no feed forward information for now. We'll deal with that in a later chapter. Short predictions horizons then. What's the impact of choosing a low value for the output or prediction horizon? What's the impact of choosing a very high value for the prediction horizon? And that actually comes in the next video, not this one. And where we're going is what therefore is a practical choice for the prediction horizon. That's where we want to get to, having understood both points one and two. Does the presence of constraints affect this understanding? That will be dealt with in a later chapter. In this particular video, we're going to focus mainly on using NU equals one with small values of NY. Here's an example then. What have we done? We've used an output horizon of five, which isn't really small, but it's moderately small. And we've printed here, or plotted, the predictions that we get at the first sample. And what do you notice about these predictions? Well, in within the prediction horizon here, they're not too bad. They've given you a balance of negative errors and positive errors, which is roughly what you expect. But critically, when you go beyond the horizon, the errors are very poor. But of course, they don't appear in the performance index. And so clearly, the overall prediction strategy is quite poor, even though within the horizon, it looks not too bad. You can get this example if you want in this particular file, which will be on the Google sites. What happens then if I increase the control horizon, which I've done here? Well, it's slightly better, but again, you can see that the long-term prediction is quite poor. If I increase the control horizon again, yep, it's slightly better, but again, the long-term is poor, and similarly, if NU goes to four. So where's our summary? Because, and this is key, the long-term predictions are poor, so that's the predictions beyond the horizon, the user is going to end up changing their mind every time they do an optimization because they say, oh, those predictions aren't going where I want. I need to change something in order to improve them. And if you keep changing your mind, then the optimization you're solving clearly does not make sense. This just shows you an example of what happens if you change the input weighting and you get a fairly similar insight. So key point, just to summarize, is the GPC optimization only looks at the errors within the horizon, which is this bit here. It doesn't look at all these errors, and therefore it doesn't take them into account in the optimization. <coughs> now, what I've plotted in this one is the actual closed loop behavior, not the prediction. And what you'll notice is the actual closed loop behavior is quite different from the predicted behavior. And again, you'll notice what we said in the previous video, if the closed loop behavior is not close to the predictions, then your optimization is ill posed. And if you get good closed loop behavior, it's by chance, not by design, because the optimum prediction you've given is not close to what's actually happened. Here's a different example. In this particular example, you can see that, albeit you're not too bad, because this is a non-minimum phase system, um, within the horizon, once you go beyond the horizon, the output predictions are clearly very poor indeed. This is in example two, again, on the Google sites. What happens if I reduce the output horizon to two? And here you can see that the predictions are totally disastrous. Or well, if I take the horizon up to six, and you might say, well, it's slightly better here, but again, the predictions really are not good at all, especially beyond the prediction horizon. So we've got the same point here. Because the predictions in the long term are quite poor, we're going to have to keep changing our mind 
on what the best input trajectory should be. And therefore, the optimization that we're doing clearly makes no sense, or in my language, is ill post. Again, for this example, what we've done here is we've plotted the closed loop prediction, or sorry, closed loop trajectories that arise alongside the open loop prediction. And you can see that they're quite different. There's a huge difference between your optimized prediction and the behavior that results. And therefore, if you get good closed loop behavior, this is due to good luck rather than good design because your optimized prediction is nowhere near this supposed good behavior that you've ended up with. Here's a third example. The difference with this example is that one of the poles is unstable. And what do you notice about the predictions in this case? Catastrophic. They're going off to infinity. They really are very poor indeed. If I increase the output horizon a bit, well, it gets slightly better, but it's still divergent. If I increase the output horizon more, slightly better, still divergent. And now I've taken the output horizon up to 10. You can look and you can say, well, at least within the horizon, I'm not too bad depending on how you define that, but clearly the overall predictions are just no good at all. If we overlay the closed loop behavior, so that's what actually results when you um, update your optimization every sample, with a prediction you've made at the first sample, again, what do you notice? These two are nothing like each other. And therefore, the fact that you end up in the closed loop with this dotted line is by chance, not by design. Final example then, this one you'll see has got complex poles, so it's quite oscillatory. Again, you'll see with a low output horizon, this response is really quite poor. If I increase the output horizon a little bit, it's still fairly poor. And even if I go up to 10, it's still fairly poor. And so what we've got again is because the long term and the short term predictions are poor, the user is going to keep changing their mind about what an ideal input should be in order to improve the behavior. And so the optimization is simply not a good optimization or it's ill posed. What does that tell us? Using prediction and optimization alone is not enough to imply that the optimized input trajectory is a good one. The optimized input trajectory could actually be a very poor choice. And in this case, if you, if you do the example and look at them, you can say, well, I can see that the optimization was not well posed. Do I understand why? Not yet, but I know that it wasn't well posed. And so either the performance index is poorly chosen and or the degrees of freedom are poorly chosen, as the combination of these has not resulted in an effective strategy. The rationale then. The performance index only penalizes tracking errors over NY samples, and it totally ignores the tracking beyond that. I'll give you an example of why this is madness. Imagine you were driving a car where you optimized your behavior only over the next two seconds with no consideration, that's the key thing, no consideration of what happens beyond two seconds. Well, you wouldn't see a corner that was 50 yards ahead until you were within 50 yards. And thus, you would make no allowance to ensure that you could get around that corner. And clearly, you might end up crashing if you're going too fast. Overtaking would be huge fun, because if you can only look two seconds ahead and you start to overtake, and then all of a sudden, you see there's some oncoming traffic or a traffic island or something else, it's not going to work. So control strategies are clearly seriously flawed and the reason they're seriously flawed is because they did not allow for the whole picture. They did not look at the whole prediction to see what's happening in the long term. They only looked at a narrow window in the immediate future with no regard to the consequences beyond. Here's another silly example just to make you think. So you're cold and you want your fire to give off more heat quickly. So what do you do? You pile on lots and lots of wood and obviously being careful not to damp down the uh, current flames. And in the short term, bits of all this new wood is going to catch a light and the fire is going to be a lot warmer and you're going to be quite happy. However, five minutes later, much more of this new wood will have caught a light and now you're going to have a raging bonfire which is far too hot and dangerous. And what was the problem here? Your decision making considered only the short term future. 
it didn't look at the long term and thus your decision making was flawed. You can think of lots of other examples if you want. The behaviour of children who often fail to think through the consequences before they act. And that's a bit like using a short prediction horizon. It's not thinking through the long term consequences, it's just thinking through what's going to happen immediately. Or some of you may have been victim to writing an angry email and posting it immediately instead of waiting overnight, reading it again and taking your time. Look through the long term, not just the short term. So a summary. If you were to use a low value for NY, or a low prediction horizon, there is no penalty on tracking errors beyond the prediction horizons. And the implied tracking errors beyond could be very large. And even though they're very large, they've got no impact on your decision making. And you can immediately see, well, that doesn't make sense. If I've got large errors beyond, surely they should influence my decision making. So what happens as a consequence is we end up repeatedly changing our mind on what is a good trajectory, which undermines the fact that you're doing an optimization in the first place. So clearly, low prediction horizons are nonsense. You simply cannot or should not do it. The question we need to ask, of course, is how big does the output horizon need to be? So conclusions. We've demonstrated through many examples that a low output horizon almost always, I haven't said always, almost always leads to very poor predictions. And the optimised predictions do not give a good match to the target over a longer horizon. So that's a key thing. You need to make sure the optimised predictions actually match the target over a longer horizon beyond the horizon. If you use low output horizons, they don't deal well with non-minimum phase characteristics, they don't deal well with unstable open loop behaviour, or with oscillatory open loop pulse. The use of an associated performance index can therefore be very misleading, as it actually does not imply optimality in any reasonable sense. So being optimal over a short prediction horizon doesn't mean you're going to be optimal in the long term. And in summary, again, you cannot use a small output horizon and expect the performance index to be meaningful.